This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Have you found a meaning in existence? What do you want out of life? And, of equal importance, what does life want out of you? Recently, a man on the street pollster asked pedestrians in the city of San Francisco this question, what do you want out of life? One man answered, I'm pretty happy the way things are. I'm married. I'd like to have three or four children. I've already got a wife, but I don't want to be anyone else or do anything else. Just be what I am, happy and healthy, and I want some peace of mind, he said. The housewife answered the question saying, I want a house on top of a hill, four children. I like my life. I'm very happy. I'm married. We're starting a family, and I have what I want. An auto mechanic replied, I want to live to a ripe old age lead a long, full, happy life. I want to enjoy life before I'm too old to enjoy it. I'd like a home and a family. My secret ambition is to travel. And a lab technician said, I don't want a lot of material things just to see the world I live in, but maybe someday to have an art collection, or at least get to see great art. Those were some of the things people said they wanted out of life. But what does life want out of people? For what purpose were you really born upon this earth why are you here? Where are you going? I once talked to a man who told me his job was so dull it was all he could do to keep from falling asleep. But as we talked, I had to wonder, was it really the job that was so dull, or was it perhaps this man? His attitude was so listless and lethargic, so unenthusiastic. If he were an astronaut, he'd doze off during a moon landing nine times out of ten. It really isn't life that's dull. It is we who are dull in our attitude that we take toward life. We live unaware of the astonishing possibilities around us, and even more importantly, we live unaware of the astonishing possibilities within us. Indwelling our minds is the living Spirit of God. Wrote the Apostle, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells within you to lead, to guide, to instruct, to inspire. It watches and waits within the mortal mind for the transformation of your life. Whomever you may be, you have an elementary choice in how you're going to live your life. You can either drift along with the tide or put in your paddle and row. Which will it be? The decision is yours. It makes all the difference in the world. If you choose God's way for you, life will take directions never found before. And with this newfound purpose will come renewed courage. Jesus taught to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done. For the will of God, the wisdom of God, the direction of God, the guidance of God in your life, it is accessible. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. And rather than dreading difficulty, learn from it. Consider the fact that you can see farther at night, for example, than you can in broad daylight. At night, realize you're able to perceive the stars, which are invisible during daytime. Yet those stars are millions of miles more distant than anything visible on even the sunniest afternoon. So it is with trouble, problems, difficulties. In the dark midnight of human suffering, you glimpse glimmering insights and truths more lofty than ever you could see on sunny days. Hence, have no fear of affliction. Difficulties are but educational episodes. Jesus said, Blessed or happy are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, Rejoice. Yes, rejoice even in the midst of persecution and suffering. He said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. As it is written, man proposes, but God disposes. And ultimately, the Most High's rule in the kingdoms of men. And if you give your life wholeheartedly, all you are, your time, your energy, your substance, your being to God, in consecrated commitment and say, God, use me, all of me, God will use you. And it will not be easy. It will not be simple. But it will be the greatest adventure, and you will be part of the building of the kingdom of God, of a new age, of a spiritual awakening upon this troubled planet. But it requires commitment, and for the greatest of undertakings, it requires complete commitment. The greatness of Jesus' teaching lies even more in his life than in his words. 
Jesus' thoughts were majestic, but Jesus' life was magnificent. Study the way Jesus loved people. That is how God loves people. The very affection which shone forth in the compassion of his eyes as he saw a beggar or someone who was lame or ill or afflicted mentally or spiritually. Such is the love God has for you. Such is the love with which God ministers spiritually to you. Study the way Jesus cared about people. Ponder Jesus' forgiving compassion. Such is the forgiveness, the mercy of God. Reflect upon Jesus' deep concerns. So God is concerned for every aspect of your life. Think of how Jesus called forth the best in people. So it is that God calls forth the best in you. Jesus' greatest sermon was his life itself. God can transform human lives even today as Jesus transformed human lives 2,000 years ago. For God reigns supreme. And if God will reign supreme in your life by your free will decision, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all other things of importance will be added to you. No matter how God's will may seem to you at first, no matter how unattractive or wretched or uninviting it may appear to be, you may be certain of this, that once you actually get into it, into the vital and valiant doing of God's will every day of your life, you're going to discover that that's what's right for you. I mean, really right. Not just temporarily pleasing, but right. Even contrary to appearances, doing God's will is the only thing that will ever make you truly, authentically happy in your life. God's will sometimes looks to be dismal, but turns out to be a delight. There is joy in the finding and knowing of God and in the serving of God, loving God. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, my followers, my learners, that you love one another. He said, a new command, but I give you that you love one another as I have loved you with a fatherly, parental compassion. Jesus said, God is spirit. God's Spirit indwells your mind, which is a different thought that many people have. Some conceive of God as like the referee in one of those professional wrestling matches you see on television where the referee is constantly flustered and ineffectual, vainly attempting to restore some order or justice in the ring, gesturing earnestly that the participants please obey the rules while in fact they're tearing and illegally kicking and biting each other but utterly powerless to do anything about it, wholly ignored by the participants. That's the way a professional wrestling referee has always struck me, and some people think God is sort of that way. He means well, but he really can't do anything, doesn't have the power, doesn't have the intelligence to figure out when something's going wrong. But Jesus taught God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is the author of all reality and can architect a new life for you if you will turn over your old life to God, your present life as you are and as you're living it. Give it all to God. Say, bless this mess, but it's yours. I consecrate it. Then trust God and have faith in God. Jesus didn't say, man shall not live by bread. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. And that one additional word says volumes. Jesus didn't say not to eat. He just said, don't be satisfied with eating and nothing else because you need spiritual nourishment. You need God. You need a living, vital relationship with God. You need a life of prayer and worship. Every day, sharing your life with God, asking God's guidance and insight into the solving of your problems, the meeting of your difficulties, getting along with people, running your business, the home, the family, wherever you are, God's Spirit is there with you. And then to worship God every day, to praise God, to let your life spill over at the brim in gladness for God. For there's a satisfaction of soul and spirit in forgetting yourself entirely and losing yourself in the love of God, which until you experience it, if you've never experienced it, you'll not imagine what a joy, what a delight, what a transforming experience worship is. 
It's not something you're forced to do. The universe doesn't work that way. God doesn't make you pray, doesn't make you worship. Your Father will not force you to praise Him. It must be a free and joyful, spontaneous overflowing of the soul. Have you ever been around somebody you just had the feeling really felt forced or obligated by the social circumstance to talk with you but wasn't enjoying it? God doesn't want some mock, hypocritical religiosity, some prayer which is a barter or a bargain. I'll praise you for three minutes, God, if you will fix the car or make the plumbing work better or some such thing as this or put a million dollars in the bank account. No, it's not trading. It must be from the bottom of your heart and from the top of your mind and your soul loving God freely. You are free to stand before a beautiful sunset with your eyes shut if you want to. You're free to sit at a symphony concert with your fingers in your ears. You can hold your nose while you're walking through a flower garden if you really want to. You can clench your teeth through a banquet and not eat one single bite if you want. You are free to refuse what is given to you, and you can reject the things of God in precisely the same way. Or, if you will, you can accept them and claim them and live them as your own. That choice is before you this moment as you listen to this radio broadcast. But down through the corridor of the centuries, there echoes a voice, Come all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, if you will give your life to God. With all your heart, and commit your soul to the service of God, the love and the worship of God, for all your days upon this earth, and all eternity beyond, you will be transformed. If you dare to say, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. This is my commitment. I know not what others may do, but as for me and my house, we will serve God. It will be the greatest and most significant moment in all your mortal life. Let it be for you right now. And then write to us, will you? We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, any and all of this literature. Yours free, without cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A-93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.